with regards to the uh, the water method, um, what would be the origins of it, and uh, yeah, basically where would it have come from? Everyone thinks, oh, if you go to China, you're just going to get really good material, and you know, because everyone in China does qigong, right? A hundred million people do tai chi every day, so everybody knows what it is. Yes, and then you go to China and you watch people. And you're like, what are they doing, you know? And it's just so radically different. I mean, there's so many forms. There's hundreds of thousands of forms. And not all of those forms by any stretch are full of internal content, yes? And so we find ourselves today with a very deep system, a very complete and integrative system. So, where does it come from? How does it get here? People look at this, you know, the scholars go into the manuscripts and they go into, well, what's the oldest documents? And um, I'd like to go into this a little bit because a lot of those documents have been eradicated. So today we have a lot less than there were a hundred years ago less than. The Cultural Revolution did a really good job of destroying a lot of those ancient documents and, and scriptures and the old scrolls, the old writings. And so what we were left with today is a fragment of that material, but the oral tradition comes through. And so this is our line, is from the oral tradition. This doesn't come from documents. This doesn't come from writings. This comes from being passed from teacher to student, and then the student becomes the teacher, and the teacher teaches the next generation, so on and so forth. And so a lot of those lines were broken during that period when Chairman Mao was in power. And so, you know, what has come to us today is, is um, very unique in that sense of it's still complete. So everybody knows that it comes out of the mists of time, it comes from China, but if you really look to the roots of Taoism, Taoism was there before China existed as a country. Taoism was there before Tibet existed as a country. And so we're in an age before the defining of these countries. And so to call it Chinese is really not totally accurate, is it? From what I understand, the oldest documents that we have today are a little bit more than 2,000 years old. When they opened up some tombs in China, they found some old versions of the Tao Te Ching and the I Ching and so this is now recognized as the oldest. But it doesn't go back as far as um, the age of Lao Tzu, for instance, two and a half thousand years ago. And it doesn't, and those documents don't predate Lao Tzu. The oral tradition definitely does. My teacher writes in, um, in his book on Bagua, Bagua and Tai Chi, he writes a piece here about his teacher and what his teacher taught him about the, uh, the origins of this material, the origins of Bagua. And Bagua is in the original material of Taoism because there's the original core material that came from thousands of years ago. And then there's these various practices, offshoots, um, reworkings of the Nagong system that have come around later on. And I'd like to get into that a little bit. If we, if we can. Yeah, my teacher was told by his teacher that the single palm changes existed for 1500 years in a monastery in China. And in that monastery, they had other documents that predated that, that showed that the, the Bagua tradition came from the Kunlun Mountains around 4,000 years ago. Lao Tzu wrote about the water method, and I think he might have been the one that coined the phrase water method in the Tao Te Ching. And that was written two and a half thousand years ago. 
And so that material is already very old, but that's not its origin. He was reporting on and discussing that material. He was presenting a treaty on what it was, but he was not claiming to be the originator of the material. Now, the I Ching is also encapsulating water method Taoism, and that's said to be written 4,000 years ago. And yet its history goes further back. And this is interesting because the I Ching is the understanding of change and how to apply change and how to understand change in a cosmic and material world. And yet this is really in the mind. It's not in the body. And Bagua is the practical application of the I Ching to apply the principles of change inside of you and to connect with, learn, join with the energies that generate change and to practice to the point of clearing out your system so that you can merge with change or bypass change. And so Bagua is seen as the physical application and the I Ching is seen as the mental understanding of those principles of change. But they're coming from the same place, they're coming from the same era, and they, they were set, they were complete 4,000 years ago. It's like, this is one of the issues with the, the structures in Egypt, you know, the oldest, pyramids are the biggest, most accurate pyramids that are there. So what, they just suddenly made pyramids enormous and perfect, and then as they went on, they got worse. So obviously there's a build-up pre that Egyptian culture to have the technology and the knowledge to build those pyramids, and the same is relevant here. 4,000 years ago is not the origination of the material. It just was completed in some way. It was whole in some way at that point in time. And then that has carried through. And it came through Lao Tzu. And then it has been passed down from teacher to student for many, many, many generations. And what we have is one of the pure threads that goes back to that original work, that goes back to Lao Tzu and back to that material 4,000 years ago and beyond. And um, if you follow what my teacher has um, said and what he has taught and what he has written, he puts pieces out in various books about the origins of the material, how it got here and all the rest of it. And what we're discussing here is based on that, not, is based on that information that I've received from my teacher. And that goes beyond that 4,000 years ago. It was 4,000 years ago that it came into China. But 4,000 years ago, China and Tibet didn't exist. Yes, the countries in themselves, the land was there, people were there, but it wasn't China as we know it or Tibet as we know it. This is a very old lineage. And that old lineage goes back possibly thousands of years before the I Ching was written and completed. And thousands of years before Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching. And so there was a period of time where it was being developed. Um, but what we know is 4,000 years ago, it was whole and complete. And there's one very, very important thing here with the Nagong system. The oldest, most complete, most integrative, most advanced of our practices, God's plan in the clouds, is said to be 4,000 years old. And yet the other practices that we use, less complete, less whole, less advanced, are younger. So again, this points to the whole system was there, yes? 
the Bagua, the work with the Ijing, the God's plane in the clouds, Nagong. This was all there, the Taoist meditation. This was all there 4,000 years ago. And it wasn't being born then and growing up. It was born, grown up, it had been worked through many generations and was complete at that point in time. And then if you look at the other practices we use, like energy gates or heaven and earth, these other Neigong, they are a thousand years later. They're around 3,000 years old. And then if you go to something like our dragon and tiger, that's even later, that's only 1,500 years old, yes? If you go to Tai Chi itself, that's only a few hundred years old. This is another reworking of the Neigong system. You know, most people go, oh, Tai Chi, it's old. Yeah, ish, old-ish, yes. But the other material predates Tai Chi by thousands of years. And so you see this complete thing, God's plane in the clouds, the Bagua, the meditation practices, and back then, when I'm talking about Bagua, I'm talking about Bagua, not Bagua Zhang, yes? Bagua as a spiritual art. Bagua to make the body healthy, strong. Bagua to manifest the energies of change within you and to understand change. That Bagua, not the martial art of Bagua Zhang, okay? The original Bagua was not martial arts. It was spiritual in nature. And so this original model, and then to learn this material is really difficult as a whole thing. And therefore, my feeling, okay, this isn't what I was taught, or this isn't what my teacher taught me or told me or whatever. But my feeling is that complete package is so deep, broad, so intense that we need stepping stones into it. We need a way of getting to that level of practice. And therefore the five element Neigong system broke into the various pieces. So you could learn aspects of it. This chunk, this chunk, this chunk, this chunk, and then you can bring it together. And then even with like dragon and tiger, which is a splinter practice of the wood element of heaven, heaven and earth, Qigong. It's a piece of it. Again, there's a lot within heaven and earth, and therefore a piece of it is brought into play so you can really work that piece. The same as when we do stuff with open and closing. Open and closing is another deep aspect of the, the, the wood element. And that gets peeled off out of the wood element, out of heaven and earth, so that we can play with that. Breathing, another aspect of Nagong, that gets peeled off. So you can play with these aspects and get these aspects alive and solid. And then you can take that and weave that in and integrate that into the more advanced material. And so again, there's this stepping down to give people the ability to come in. And there are so many reworkings of the Nagong system out there that has gone on over the last 4,000 years. It's incredible. And so all these various styles and methods of moving and forms and all these different things, because this person has this particular quality, that person has another particular quality, or this person is attracted to that particular practice, or this person is attracted to a different particular practice. And so now there's an array of practices, yes? And then if you go through various practices, Behind those practices is the Neigong system. And so when you go into any deep Qigong or Tai Chi or Bagua system, you get into the Neigong. The Neigong is what powers it. The Neigong is what it's built out of. They're the threads that are woven together to make the cloth. Yes. But then the cloth can be cut into various possibilities. Trousers, jackets, skirts, shirts. Boom. You know, you're basically talking about something that's thousands of years old. And, you know, they 
they had cal- uh, kind of figured out and understood kind of truthful mechanisms and uh, principles and you know those were the foundation of everything that they set in place through uh, the original bagua practice and the eating and the original uh, meditation and um yeah that, that's pretty incredible really isn't it to see, to see that as the course of time has moved forward it's need to be it has uh been made available to us in kind of simpler chunks as it were in some way shape or form to enable us to comprehend something that's so um so particular particularly dense and just you know full of material like a immense amounts of material when life is simple and you have more time on your hands and the time you have, you can devote to your practices. But in the modern world now, we're going through another reworking of the material because why? People have less time. They have less time. They have less space to practice. So things are being developed in a way that allows people to get benefit from that, even though they're not going to be willing to put in the commitment to go all the way to the most advanced levels. But it was never meant to anyway just be for a specific few. It was for anybody that wanted to get into the game, you know. This is a long time we're talking about. To work on specific aspects. And so different monasteries would work on different aspects for 100 years, 200 years. And today we say, okay, a generation's 25 years. So four to eight generations you work on something. Oh, yeah, that's worked for all those people in those general. Right now, let's implement it, you know, throughout the entire monas- monastic system. And this is the position of Lao Tzu. He was the head of the system of monasteries in China. And he was the one overseeing everything at that point in time. And so this wasn't like just random people doing this and that. It was very interconnected. Information passed freely between the monasteries. And so the good material was incorporated and the weak material was left behind. And I just don't think we give the ancients credit for this. But if you look around the world, the ancients have done some amazing things in that time frame, you know. Again, the pyramids. They've asked modern engineers to make a pyramid like that at Giza, and they've gone, oh, I don't even want to start. Because what would be involved? Yeah, they did that thousands of years ago. We're just looking at uh, an internal system, an internal development, rather than an external development. And so if you imagine the energy and the time that went into developing the technologies to build the pyramids thousands of years ago, before modern machine tools and cranes and everything. And then you put all that energy into internal development. That's basically what the Taoists were up to. But then, you know, the, I mean, with with that comes the responsibility of passing it down. And I think, you know, you know, you, you've talked about it in the past, but that's that's also the importance of lineage, isn't it? And, and passing it down in a in a credible lineage through through to credible people who will represent and pass down the material you know intact down to future generations so it's um yeah it's big work this is why the training was vigorous and we're kind of losing it now in the modern world less people are willing to put in the effort but now you've opened up that 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 question of the lineage the importance of the lineage and the importance of holding the material whole rather than partial and making sure that there aren't misunderstandings because when you're doing deep critical chi work if you do it wrong you can cause problems to people or yourself if it's your practice or if you're passing it on in a in a in the wrong way it can be detrimental to people's health and well-being rather than you know helping them and so yeah this has always been like the goal and this has been the 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 goal and the responsibility of lineage masters throughout the time you know and our own teacher hasn't made any formal disciples 
but then his teacher, Liu, Liu Hung Jae, gave Bruce permission to teach the material openly. And so since he's been back in the West and since he's been teaching, he's been teaching at the level of discipleship to whoever walks through the door. And so, yeah, no formal disciples have been made in his school at this point in time. But everybody in the school has been exposed to that depth of material. Generally in the past, it's always been kept within families or within lineages or within uh, monasteries, within villages, in order not to pass on this really deep material to people that one or two generations later could become your enemies. And so that really made a shift. That made a shift in the way this material is being released out into the world. And of course, you know, Bruce went to China. He became fluent in Chinese. He was there for over a decade, solid working on this material, got to some of the highest teachers in China and brought back an amazing piece of machinery. Amazing. And so, yeah, and here we are, you know. We're on the tail end of that. And so there is responsibility, there's responsibility. And if there's one thing I've heard my teacher say for many, many years, again and again and again, if you learn this material and you become a certified instructor in the material, go out and teach. It's not just for you, it's for people. That's always been behind his drive, is passing it on to as many people as deep as he can, with whomever can absorb it, and as many people as are willing to come in. Just doing this material at a low level gives you benefit. And it really hit me when my teacher said, oh, this material is so well designed that when you do it really poorly, you get a good result. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, well, yeah, but that doesn't really indicate how far it can go and what you can get if you do it really well. So anyway, back to, back to Liu. Liu had the opportunity to work with really a lot of very high level masters. He was in the original Beijing Bagua school. He learned direct from some of the people that learned direct from Dong Haishuan, who is the originator of the Bagua system, at least modern Bagua, at least Bagua Zhang. Bagua Zhang was not known in the public in China until the 18th century. And so this is just incredible that it's only surfaced a couple of hundred years ago. Yes. And yet for thousands of years it remained secret, held within the monastic tradition in China. And so Dong taught four people. He had 72 acknowledged students or disciples. And he would only teach martial arts masters. So for a start, you had to be a master in one art before he would entertain teaching you. So this shows you that it's like, you know, the cream of the internal arts. And then he would take you on board and he had four main teachers or four main students, I should say. Nobody knows who taught him. He would never say who taught him, where he got it from. That Nobody has ever answered that question. Who taught Dong Haishuan? Nobody knows. He kept that quiet. And then he taught four people. And out of those four people, Liu managed to work with one of them directly. Yes, Ma Guai. And he worked directly with um, Shen Yulong, and Shen Yulong was the son of Shen Tinghua. And Shen Tinghua was Dong's second disciple. And Liu also learned from people that learned with uh, Yin Fu, because originally Ma Guai was a student of Yin Fu, and then Dong took Ma Guai on as a disciple and taught him directly. And so if you look in the back of Bruce's uh, book on Bhagwan Tai Chi, it has his lineages here. And it shows in here, at the back of the book, the lineage from Bruce 
to Liu and then through back to Dong Haishuan. It names the people. It shows the line directly. So Liu was in the original Beijing Bagua school and he learned directly from the people, the um, Dong Haishuan first generation and then these other people, Yin Fu, Ma Weiqi and Shen Tinghua were second generation. Ma Guai was third generation under Yin Fu, but then worked directly with Dong. Our Bagua forms hold both the um, Yin Fu willow leaf palm and Shen Tinghua's dragon palm for that reason, because Liu was exposed to these various styles and lines. And the reason the styles are there is because Dong taught his students what made sense to them from what art they already knew. Because really and truly, Bagua is not a form. It's the Neigong that's within the form. So the Neigong can be developed in any form if you really know what you're doing. And so Dong would look at the movements, the style of movement, the forms that person had learned, and then would teach them Bagua based on their natural abilities. Yes, and so you get these different threads coming from Dong Haishuan. But because Liu learned directly with Shen Yulong, who was Shen Tinghua's son, who learned directly from Dong, also Ma Guai, who learned directly from Dong, and also other people in that school. Other people taught Liu. Liu was the youngest member, and so they all took a liking to Liu and they taught him. He was a very good student. He worked very hard and diligently and he embodied the material to the point that he represented the Beijing Bagua school in the all open fighting um, competition in 1928, I think it was. They took their youngest member to represent the school. So he obviously knew what he was doing, huh? Because like that, that's unusual to take the youngest, least experienced individual and put them in there. You normally take your best person to make sure you get the best chance of winning. That's incredible lineage, isn't it, really? The teachings he was exposed to, which, which are basically direct, aren't they, really? It just doesn't, you're what, one generation removed from Dong at, 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 uh, at most, you know, with all that exposure. Our forms, they're more in line with the way Shen Tinghua did his Bagua. And because uh, because Yin Fu's material is is more linear, you know his his whole willow leaf palm uh, methodology is much more linear. And Shen Tinghua was into Chinese wrestling, so he has more throws. So his is much more spiraling, circular, spherical than Yin Fu's material. Liu learned directly in that line. So our forms are from Shen Tinghua, but Bruce said Liu learned the critical chi work and the meditation work from Ma Guai. And also, I think he's also known as Ma Xie Qing. Yeah. yeah. Lots of these people have two names, you know. Ma Wei Qi was a different character. Our forms have various aspects. Aspects of Yin Fu's system, aspects of Shen Tinghua's system, aspects of Ma Guai's system. And these have come together so Within our lineage, we have quite a lot of the material that Dong taught to various people. And so, yeah, this is really rare. This is really, really rare. And to have all the internals and the Neigong and the Qi work. But this is just one line that Liu did, you know, because Liu also learned directly from Wu Jianchuan. Wu Jianchuan was the co founder of the Wu style of Tai Chi. So Wu Jianchuan and his father Shang Yu, they developed the Yang style. Shang Yu learned from Yang Yu Chan. And so again, we have a very, very direct lineage. Yang Lu Chan, who got it from the Shen style Tai Chi village. Yang Lu Chan passed it to Shang Yu down to Wu Jianchuan, who continued and completed the development of the Wu style from his father. And then Wu Jianchuan taught um, Liu Hongzhi 
directly. So again, we're only a few steps away from and directly from the originator of the Wu style. And so again, our Wu style is full of Neigong. The entire 16 Neigong can go in the Bagua we use. The entire 16 Neigong can go in the Tai Chi we use. The entire 16 Neigong goes in the God's plane in the clouds that we use. And so now you have Taoist Neigong, Tai Chi and Bagua with the full Taoist Neigong within it. So this is really, really unusual to see so much depth within a single lineage. And it was Liu br that brought all that together. Wu Jianchuan didn't train Bagua. Shen Tinghua didn't train Tai Chi, you know? So these were individual threads that were coming through and Liu drew them together. And they're not the only ones he drew together either because he went further than that. He learned from all those people in the Beijing Bagua school. And then he went off to the mountains in China and connected with the original Bagua monastic practice. Everything Dong did and everything Dong taught was a martial tradition. It had the Neigong in it. It had meditation, Taoist meditation within it. But it didn't go all the way through the eight body system. So when Liu went and connected with the, with the uh, monastic tradition, they completed his work and showed him the monastic tradition, which went further than the martial tradition, deeper than the martial tradition. And so again, you find, ah, oh, this man was uh, a unique individual. Well, that's just incredible provenance and, and lineage, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's got to be kind of like uncommon amongst the most uncommon things, hasn't it? Really, just those two direct lines. But then that's, that's not something that's normal at all, really. It just, you know, it's just, you know, at, at most you're going to hear people talk about perhaps some, some type of martial lineage and some type of martial version of, of either the, the Tai Chi or, uh, or the Bagua. But, um, you know, to be exposed to all of that directly and in both those lines, and to be able to absorb it as well. I mean, you know, you know, Lou must have been, you know, without a doubt, some, you know, a genius as well as being able to contain and pass all of that on. It's just, you know, that's, you know, that's, a, yeah, that's pretty amazing. He also studied uh, Buddhism, and he went really far in Buddhism before he went into Taoism. He was just one of those people that had that capacity. And they don't come around in every generation. He was driven, he was talented, and he brought it all together. And so when Bruce was training with Liu, Liu taught Bruce to understand how all this comes together, how it all has the same root, how it's all been developed, what the original material was what was developed later and so on, what was influenced by this or by that. Tai Chi came out of the Shaolin Monastery. It's the Shaolin, the best battlefield techniques of the Shaolin Temple with Taoist Neigong. Again, a reworking and a fusion of these different lines to bring about this. And then of course you've got Xing Yi, which is another opening which is not as old as the the original material and then you've got um, various half internal half external styles that have been developed there's combination styles where they work aspects of Xingyi Tai Chi and Bagua together and join those together I mean China has just been like this over the centuries over the millennia like reworking remodeling re-adapting and so in the modern world there are so many different possibilities and so many different ways of doing it and some of those are really really good and solid but a lot of them just lack depth they're more about the form than the content and when you're talking Neigong it's all content 
the, the form, the container is only there so the content can work. You know, to drive down the road, you can have the best engine, gearbox, wheels, seats and everything. If you don't have a chassis, right, you can't put that lot together, bolt it together and have it work. Without a body, without the body work, you're not protected when you go down the road. You're exposed. Yes. So the form is the chassis and the body work. The Nagong is everything that's making that car move. Yes. And so, yeah, the deeper, the more complete, the more pure, the more whole, the more ancient, the more rare. That kind of lineage just doesn't, or even the material or both, you know, to, to have that come through one line, that's, yeah, that, I mean, that's particularly rare. And, you know, if, if you speak to people in, in other schools, they, they might have a thread or two of perhaps some Nagung and a version of, um, and when you talk to them a bit deeper, they kind of seem to just have those to some extent, but that really is, it's just like the one of the two threads, and it's just, or, or maybe a few threads, but to have the 16 Nagung all together is pretty special, really. Well, if we look at our Dragon and Tiger, basically it's several of the Nagung threads, isn't it? There's aspects of breathing, there's working with the etheric field, there's running the meridian lines of the body, and that's basically where it lies. So it's got some of the Nagong. And you find this in many, many, many schools. Some schools advertise themselves as this particular branch of Qigong or that particular branch. And what they're focusing in on is one of the Nagong threads. And therefore, their whole system is built off of that one thread of the Nagong. The 16 is a completely different kettle of fish, yes? Especially when you consider the first 12 of the preparatory phases, the last four of the Nagong is the completion phase. And then, of course, half a yin and half a yang. And that then, oh, there's balance here. Yeah, balance is a requirement for integration. If you don't have balance, you don't integrate. If one thing's running really well and one thing's poorly, they don't integrate. Yes? You have everything running well, now you can integrate those aspects that are running well. For us in today's society, um, the methodology, that, that slow, gentle method, is what's going to help kind of uh, current day practitioners contain that material because, you know, in amongst everything else that's being pushed and the the amount of overwhelming information that your average normal person comes across and has to contain within their their mind is it's kind of too much for most people anyway um so this this slower gentler uh water method methodology is kind of like perfect isn't it really for for people to uh to practice and and to to follow uh, to, to make it relevant for for themselves. <laughs>